Welcome back everybody, my name is Tucker. In today's video, I'm continuing my series talking about some of the biggest high pick draft busts in NBA history and why exactly they went so high in their particular draft classes. The first time it was Anthony Bennett going number one overall in 2013. And in today's video, it's Hashim Thabit going number two overall in the 2009 class. But really quickly, before we get started, if you enjoy the NBA, then consider subscribing. I upload basically every single day. Okay, so as always, let's kind of review the career of Hashim Thabit leading up to the draft. Then we'll talk about why he was picked where he was and why it went wrong. So Thabit was in contrast to someone like Anthony Bennett that we talked about in the previous video, not necessarily an extremely highly touted high school player. He was a four-star recruit in the class of 2006 and a guy that only really started picking up a basketball and playing around age 15. Then when he came to the States, he started to grow his game and ended up receiving a scholarship offer to UConn, which has this long tradition of shot blocking bigs. And he had a solid three-year career there. Again, in contrast to someone like Anthony Bennett that was a one and done type player, the beat was at UConn for three years. He improved every single season. His minutes went up every single season. And by his junior year was one of the best players in the country, certainly one of the best big men in the country as a huge shot blocking threat and led that team to the final Final Four before declaring for the NBA draft after his junior season. And even though it might not seem like it now, there was actually a lot of excitement about Hashim Thabit coming into the 2009 NBA draft. And a lot of the excitement was around this idea that comes along with a lot of these players that do come to the States later on in their life that don't pick up a basketball until 14, 15, 16 years old. This idea that the beat still had so much potential left as a player that was a really good college player, but was still continuing to grow his game, especially in the offensive end, people thought that he could be one of the better bigs in the entire league and that that upside was what drove such a high draft selection for him. Let's go ahead and look at his pre-draft evaluation over here on NBA Draft. Net. His NBA comparison was Dikembe Mutombo, one of, if not the best shot blocking bigs in NBA history. Strengths, it says Jim Calhoun, who was the head coach of UConn at the time, called the beat, quote, one of the most dominant players in the history of college basketball. And it's hard to disagree. Had the beat returned for his senior year, he likely would have broken the NCAA career record for blocked shots. And also goes into talking about his improvement as a jump shooter and his ability to move his feet on the defensive in and surprising quickness for his size. So it wasn't just the shot blocking things in terms of his pre-draft evaluation. There were other parts of his game that were starting to expand and that were a bit surprising that people were definitely getting excited about. His biggest weaknesses, however, were on the offensive end. It says post game needs refining. The beat has not learned to keep the ball high. He puts the ball on the floor way too often instead of going straight up without dribbling. This leads to turnovers and more difficult shots. Though he uses both hands fairly well, the beat lacks back to the basket moves and his hands are suspect. Offensively, he relies mostly on alley-oops and offensive rebounds to collect his points. And ultimately on NBADraft.net at least, he was ranked as their sixth best prospect in the class, but was consistently mocked to the Memphis Grizzlies at number two overall. It's pretty well known going into draft night that Hashim Thabit was going to go number two. And it's pretty clear now what kind of prospect we're dealing with here, right? Someone that is actually a pretty good athlete for his size, has incredible size, and had such a, a, a dominant physical advantage over so many players in college that that led to a lot of the production that he found offensively. And that was going to be more difficult to come by at the NBA level when he's dealing with people that are in better shape, that are stronger physically, and that are more on par with the size that the beat brings to the table. So in hindsight, it's certainly very easy to see that this is a guy that needed to improve his offensive game so much more than maybe we wanted to believe, and that we put way too much stock into his ability to continue to improve that. And we're also way too excited about this rim protection ability that he brought to the table without considering what his very limited impact would be on the offensive end. So now let's go ahead and talk about the 2009 NBA draft. And again, in comparison and in contrast to the Anthony Bennett video that I made, this was not a weak draft class at all. That 2013 class is one of the weakest, at least at the top of the class that we've seen in recent memory. And a lot of that had to do with why Anthony Bennett ended up going number one overall. But in this particular case, this was not a weak class at all. The 2009 class, everybody leading up to it knew that Blake Griffin was going to no go number one overall. But then other players in this class included James Harden, 
Rookie of the Year winner Tyreek Evans, Steph Curry, DeMar DeRozan, Drew Holiday, and Jeff Teague, along with a handful of other really productive NBA players throughout the class, guys like Darren Collison. So this class was no slouch at all. So the Grizzlies had to feel pretty strongly about taking Ashim to beat number two overall to select him above some of these other players, including future MVP winners, right? Well, yes and no, because looking back on it now, it almost kind of seems like the Grizzlies ended up picking the beat by default. They had a couple of good guards on their roster and Mike Conley and OJ Mayo that they wanted to continue to develop and kind of see what they had there. And bringing in someone like James Harden or like Steph Curry might have kind of messed with what they had going. Mayo had a great rookie season and Conley still, you know, wasn't Mike Conley yet, but still a player that they wanted to grow and develop. Not only that, but they were one of the worst defensive teams in the league the year before, and they really needed a big guy. Marc Gasol was on the roster, but had not yet emerged as Marc Gasol. And it was pretty clear that they needed not only a big guy, but preferably a defensive focused big guy. And that was their mindset leading into the draft. There is some other context here as well that I found in an article. It says the team focused on four prospects leading up to the draft. Center Hashim to beat and three versatile guards, Tyreek Evans, James Harden, and Steph Curry. Given the uncertainty, the team hoped to trade down and secure one of those four alongside another asset. But when the right deal didn't emerge, the Grizzlies needed to make a choice. And it's interesting to me here how similar to the Anthony Bennett situation, these teams wanted to trade back from the picks that they had received to get an asset and to get someone that they liked a little bit later on that maybe teams didn't like as much and let someone else take one of the more highly touted prospects at the top of the class. But that can also be seen as something that you read in hindsight where a team was like, well, we didn't really want to take the beat, but we felt like it was good value. We couldn't trade back, blah, 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 blah. When in reality, that's probably just an excuse about a player that they misevaluated in the draft and ended up taking too high. So it's just interesting how we're looking at two of the biggest draft busts in NBA history, and both teams have said in hindsight, yeah, we would have liked to trade down rather than picking them where they did. But anyway, ultimately, the team ended up taking Ashim to beat number two overall and passing on two future MVP winners in Steph Curry and James Harden and a couple of other players that ended up making all-star teams in their careers as well. Guys like Drew Holiday, guys like DeMar DeRozan, Jeff Teague, players like that. Okay, so why did Hashim Thabit fail? We obviously know that he is a bust, but what exactly was it about his, his career and his journey that caused him to not succeed in the NBA? Well, some of the evaluations were simply just off. He wasn't as quick as people thought that he was in terms of staying in front of players on the perimeter, so you kind of just had to have him camp out in the paint, and that style of defense was becoming less and less effective as teams were getting more attacking guards getting to the rim and guys that could shoot better from the outside. The beat also just didn't have the same dominant physical presence over players at the NBA level that he did at the college level, and apparently he just didn't have that much of a desire to improve once he got to the league either. And ultimately, a couple years later, the Grizzlies ended up hitting their stride as a team, and they didn't really need the beat anymore. They had Zach Randolph, they had Marcus Gasol, two emerging bigs, and within a season and a half, they were, you know, a, a, an up-and-coming team, and they didn't need the beat anymore. He wasn't ready to play minutes, and they simply didn't need him anymore. And this is a team that ended up, you know, going to the playoffs seven times in a row moving forward. They ended up making a Western Conference Finals all without the contribution of a former number two overall pick. So pretty simply, he didn't work on his game. He didn't earn big minutes. And by the time that maybe he could have contributed, they simply didn't need him anymore. And that resulted in just a two season career in Memphis, bouncing around to a couple of different teams before ultimately being out of the league after just a handful of NBA seasons. And it is kind of crazy to think about how those teams could have looked had they taken James Harden or Steph Curry, or even early years, Tyreek Evans, who was also really good. And that certainly would have changed the trajectory of those players' careers on how that would have worked out you know, it, it's unclear, but it definitely would have made those teams better. At worst, they would have had a better trade asset moving forward if they didn't like the fit of someone like Curry or Harden or whatever, alongside OJ Mayo, Mike Conley, and Zach Randolph, and, and Marcus Gasol. But either way, they certainly would have been much better off, obviously, selecting a player like that at number two or trading back and selecting one of them later on in the draft. And again, it's just crazy to see the amount of success that this team did end up having. As I said, making a Western Conference Finals a handful of years after this draft without the contributions of such a high draft pick. Literally zero contribution. And at the end of the day, that is how Hashim Thabit became the number two overall pick in the 2009 class. The Grizzlies wanted a big, they already had a couple of good guards, they misevaluated his ability to continue to improve, and he was seen as a boom or bust prospect at the time. And unfortunately, they ended up with the bust part of Hashim Thabit rather than any kind of real productive 
career. As I said, they ended up having success in spite of that, but had they made the right selection at number two overall, things could have been much, much different. Not only for them, for the rest of the league, and Memphis could have actually ended up winning a title here within the next couple of seasons past the 2009 draft. But yeah, there you have it. That is going to be the end of today's video, and I thank you all very much for watching. As always, leave down in the comment section below suggestions for future videos like this, other players you would like to see featured in terms of why they were selected number two or overall, number one overall, whatever it is, wherever they were selected, why they were picked there when ultimately it ended up being clear that they were bust. So thank you guys so much for watching. As I said in the beginning of the video, my name is Tucker. If you missed any of my previous videos, then be sure to check out the boxes on screen. Thanks again, and I'll see you all next time.